Assalamu alaikum, my dear brothers and sisters, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to welcome you all to our 11th session on the tafsir of Surah Arun, which is the 30th chapter of the Quran, a famous Meccan surah, a surah that we recite on the nights of Qadr. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we've reached uh, verse number 47. So if you have a copy of the Quran, the Mus'haf, or the Quran app, uh, you can follow along. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Ayah number 47 Wa laqad arsalna min qablika rusulan ila qawmihim Fajauhum bil bayyinat Fantaqamna min al-lazina ajramu Wa kana haqqan alayna nasrul mu'minin Allah says in verse number 47 we have indeed sent messengers to their people before you and they brought them clear proofs. Then we took vengeance upon those who were guilty and it is incumbent upon us to help the believers. In this verse, again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about the continuing the discussion on the external signs of God's mercy, His power, His wisdom. There was a discussion about the signs of God in the, the natural world, the signs of God in the world of creation. And now there is a shift to speak about the guidance and the signs that have come in the form of messengers. So Allah says, وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ رُسُلًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِمْ We have sent before you, O Muhammad, messengers to their people. وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ رُسُلًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِمْ And this إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِمْ is significant because Allah subhanahu and this is really one of the, the sunan one of the divine universal laws, the divine policies, the ways in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides people and guides nations is that he sends to them a messenger from among themselves. A messenger who was one of them. So for instance, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to send a guide, someone to guide the people of China, He's going to send, he's going to appoint someone who is from that cultural context. A person who is from among them. To make, to make, to send a messenger who will be well received by the people. Because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends a person who is perceived as a foreigner, people might have, might create this excuse that, you know, well, you don't understand our culture. You don't, you're not familiar with our traditions. You don't know our language. You don't know the nuances of our customs. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to remove any of these excuses, He sends prophets and messengers that belong to the communities that they were sent to God. وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ رُسُلًا We sent many, many messengers to their people before you. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for instance, in Surah Ibrahim, Surah 14, ayah number 4, He says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ Allah says, when we have never sent a messenger, except we sent him in the language, using the language of their people. And here language, obviously it refers to language in the literal sense, but one could also argue that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always sends messengers and prophets to, to communities whereby they understand the language, they understand the culture. And this is important for us, my dear brothers and sisters, when we, when we want to, you know, uh, we, when we want to bring people to Islam, when we choose who the representatives of our faith tradition are going to be, 
in different parts of the world. You know, if we want to if we want to establish an Islamic center in France, for example, or in you know in Italy, wherever it may be. We need to ensure that the religious guides in those areas speak the native language and understand the culture and the customs in order for them to be effective. Otherwise, that person will always be seen as the other, as someone who's foreign. So this is important for us to understand. And this applies even when we wish to guide our youth. You know, we can't keep on importing people from abroad. You know, we need, we need homegrown scholars because our children, our youth, they will be more receptive to a teacher who understands their challenges and their struggles, who speaks their language, who understands their, their references, you know, and their lingo. There is also another very beautiful verse in the Quran where Allah speaks about another sunnah, another divine policy. And that is where Allah says, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا That verily we have sent to every ummah, every nation, a messenger. Now here ummah is, you know, when you look at the Qur'an, there are different words that are used for Places. So, for example, sometimes the Quran will refer to a, a village and it will, will be called a qariya. Now, of course, in the Quran, sometimes qariya refers to a village, and in other cases, it refers to you know a massive city. Sometimes the word Medina is used, but the word ummah. So Allah says we have we have we have sent a messenger, and we know that we have 313 messengers. And all of the other prophets really were sent to support uh, those messengers. So Allah says, we have sent a messenger to every ummah, to every nation. Now when you look at this verse, some of the Mufassireen have noted that the verse doesn't say that Allah has sent a messenger to every single village. Or every single city. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent a messenger to every ummah. Now, an ummah is a nation that shares certain, they may share a language, customs, values. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not left a single ummah without a without a guide, without a messenger. Now, when Allah sends messengers to guide these ummah, these nations, where does Allah send them? You notice in the Quran, Allah always sends messengers to the major cities of those regions. So for example, the Prophet sent, Allah sent the Prophet ﷺ to Umm al-Qura, to Mecca, because Mecca is the epicenter of Arabia. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he sends Musa, does he, does, does he tell Musa, oh, go and go guide this remote village? Or does he send him to the epicenter of Egypt? He sends him to the epicenter because that is where you're going to have the most impact. And that is where the message is going to, it's going to diffuse throughout the, the region. So Allah always, so Allah doesn't need to send a messenger or a prophet to every single city or every single village. But he sends them, he sends the messengers to the major, the, the major cities, the epicenters. So that message can be heard and it can be reached. It can reach the maximum number of people. And this is also, there's an important practical lesson in this for, uh, for us, my dear brothers and sisters. And that is that if we want to spread Islam around the world, we have to ensure that we build Islamic centers and Islamic schools and uh, you know, educational institutions. And we have to build this infrastructure in the major cities around the world. You know, we need to have a center that teaches the Islam of Ahlul Bayt 
in in for example in in madrid you know in uh in washington dc in sydney australia we need to have a presence there needs to be representation we have to have faith representation in the major cities around the world so we have to follow this this quranic sunnah this divine sunnah whereby allah sends messengers to the epicenters to the major cities to the major hubs so that the message can be disseminated it can reach uh, the maximum number of people وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ رُسُلًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِمْ O Muhammad, we have indeed sent messengers to their people before you. Meaning that you are, your, your, your message is not something that's new. That we have, we have tirelessly tried to guide nations before you by sending them prophets, by sending them messengers. فَجَاءُوهُمْ بِالْبَيِّنَاتِ these messengers, they brought them, they brought the people that they were sent to guide, they brought them clear proofs. They brought them clear proofs. In many, in, in many instances in the Quran, it refers to miracles. It refers to something that is so clear that it is virtually irrefutable. It's virtually irrefutable. Whether it's a mu'jizah, it's a miracle, or it's a, a rational argument that cannot be disproved. Prophets always bring forth this type of evidence. And when this type of evidence is given, when the truth is so clear, it's so apparent, when people reject bayinat, when they reject this crystal clear message. Allah says, فَانْتَقَمْنَا مِنَّ الَّذِينَ أَجْرَمُ Then we took vengeance upon those who were guilty. When did Allah take vengeance? When did Allah punish? When does Allah punish? He punishes when the hujjah has been delivered. After the message has been clear. Only after the bayinat are delivered. Only after the truth is is crystal clear and the the evidence is irrefutable if at that point you still reject then it's very clear that it's not an epistemological issue anymore now it's a moral issue it's an issue of arrogance it's an issue of stubbornness it's an issue of rebelliousness and this is why allah at this point he seeks vengeance he punishes and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only punishes after the truth is evident that, that you've reached a point where your rejection now is just based on blind skepticism. It's based on, it's based on arrogance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for instance, in Surah Al-Isra, Surah 17, Ayah number 15, what does he say? This is another... Sunnah of Allah. It's another divine policy. Allah says, and we, we do not punish until we send a messenger. So if there is a community, if there is a nation to whom the message has not reached, Allah and His justice and His mercy he would not punish them. Now, even if bad things happen, if there's some type of calamity, we can't say, oh, this was a punishment of God. We don't know. You know, it's important for us not to comment when we witness, you know, uh, natural disasters. You know, people are very quick to comment. Act, they act like they're Allah's spokesman. When a natural, there's an earthquake, oh, this must, this is a punishment for, for the people of Hawaii, or this is a punishment for the people of Iran, or this is a punishment for the, the people of this region or that region. This is not, these discussions are beyond our jurisdiction. We have to, we have to understand that one event, a single event can be a punishment for some and a reward for others. You know, in the same way, when, in, when, a, when a teacher gives an exam, that exam is in a sense a punishment for those who didn't study. 
but it's a reward in in another way. It's in, in, in another way for those who are studious, who are who are good students, because it gives them an opportunity to demonstrate their knowledge. So the exam that a teacher gives to the students, that same exam can function as a punishment and as a means of distinction for some students. And therefore, we, we have to look at that these we have to look at these natural disasters and, and you know the difficulties of life through that lens. We have to have a more nuanced understanding that we shouldn't make blanket statements that this natural disaster is a punishment or this is a, a rahmah for these people. So Allah says, then we took vengeance upon those who were guilty. And it is incumbent upon us to help the believers. You know, sometimes the help that Allah gives the mu'min comes in the form of vanquishing the enemies of God. You know, sometimes, you know, you know, how did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help Bani Israel? How did he come to their rescue? One of the ways in which Allah helped them is that he drowned, he destroyed, he destroyed Fir'aun. So sometimes this, this, the way that Allah helps us is obvious. It's, it comes in the form of destroying the, the enemies, you know, bringing down the tyrants. But this is, this is a promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is something that he has made incumbent upon himself. That he will always come to the aid of the believers. But the question is, how does this help come? In what form does it come? See, this is where we have to understand that when Allah gives victory, sometimes that victory doesn't come in the way that we expect. So for example, when the Prophet ﷺ, when he sees that dream, you know, this was, uh, uh, I believe in the sixth year after the Hijrah, when he sees the dream that he's performing Umrah and the, the Muslims join him and they're intercepted by the Mushrikeen and they end up having to sign the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah. They have to make some concessions. For many, for many, many of the prominent companions of the Prophet were frustrated. They thought that this was a defeat. How humiliating. We're, we've done the ihram and we're on our way to perform Umrah and now we have to turn back home. But what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in the Quran? Inna fatahna laka fathan mubina. This was a victory that Allah gave them, but they didn't they weren't able to perceive it because they didn't have the foresight. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, do you think to many, if you just look at it through a worldly lens, Imam al Hussein was militarily defeated on the day of Ashura. But the reality was that Allah grant, Allah gave him the greatest victory. And if you don't believe that Imam al Hussein was victorious. If you don't believe that Allah aided and supported Imam Hussein, go to Karbala. Look at what happens around the world in the month of Muharram during Arba'in. وَكَانَ حَقًّا عَلَيْنَا نَصْرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ So the, the, help, the divine help comes in different forms. Sometimes what we think looks like defeat is actually a precursor for victory. So the most important thing is what? That we are mu'mineen. Allah says, it is incumbent upon me to help the mu'mineen. So instead of being so fixated on how does Allah help the mu'mineen, we need to look inward and strive to be among the mu'mineen. Because if you're among the mu'mineen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His support, His aid will definitely come. As Allah says, you know, that do not feel defeated, do not feel weak. You will be the highest people. You will be the most elevated. You will be the most supreme if you are believers. So if you want this nas, this victory, this help, this divine assistance, this divine support, the, the condition is what? To have Iman. وَكَانَ حَقًّا عَلَيْنَا نَصْرُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ
verse number 48. Allahu alladhi yursilu al-riyaha fituthiru sahaban fayabsutuhu fi al-samaa kayfa yashaa wa yaj'aluhu kisafan fatara al-wadqa yakhruju min khilali fa'idha asaba bihi man yashaa min ibadi idha hum yastabshirun Allah says, God is he who sends down, who, who sends the winds. Then they cause clouds to rise and he spreads them in the sky as he wills and makes them into fragments. Whereupon you see the rain emerging from their midst. Then he bestows it, meaning the rain, upon whomsoever he will among his servants, behold, they rejoice. You know, a few, a few quick reflections on this verse, because again, I think the verse is, is fairly, uh, uh, it's fairly clear, is that in this verse, the, the word rih is used in the plural. And you'll notice that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about, you know, there are two types of winds that are mentioned in the Quran. The winds of mercy, right? If you recall, when we looked at verse number 46 last week, Allah said, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ يُرْسِلَ الرِّيَاحَ مُبَشِّرَاتِ And from among his signs is that he sends the winds, which is in the plural form, Riyah is the jama' of rih. Rih is singular, riyah is plural. And among his signs is that he sends the winds as bearers of glad tidings to let you taste of his mercy. So when, so when the winds of mercy are mentioned, wind is in the plural form. Now, when winds of destruction are mentioned, for example, when Allah spoke about the, uh, the destruction of past nations, of, for example, uh, of Ad, he mentions a violent wind. Singular. So when winds of mercy are mentioned, it uses the plural. When, when a destructive wind is mentioned, it uses what? It uses the singular. And this is, this is a very beautiful subtlety in the Qur'an. And that is that most of the wind that, that we see, that we experience, is positive. It's rahmah. And occasionally, occasionally there is what? There is a destructive wind. So again, highlighting here the idea that Allah's mercy always outweighs His wrath. We see this even in the created order. Now, another thing that's, uh, that's very uh, striking about this verse is that, you know, when we think about the formation of clouds, you know, especially when you look up at the sky, you know, if you're having a very lazy you know, weekend, you might be playing with your kids and you're just laying on the grass and you just stare into the heavens, you see that you can see the clouds moving and they're breaking apart or they're coming together. And it seems to be a very random process. It looks random, but what does Allah say? Allah causes the clouds to rise and he spreads them in the sky. So you, so you think that the, the, the clouds are moving in this random motion that there's no, there's nothing guiding it, but Allah says, Allah is guiding every single cloud. And even when it, when the clouds break into little fragments, this is all happening under God's direction, under His will. And every single raindrop, every single raindrop that falls, every single raindrop. Is controlled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, of course, there is a there's a natural process, but Allah wants us to look past the proximate causes. You know, this is what it means to have a heart that is alive, to have when when the eye of the heart is open, you're able to see the ultimate cause. 
that what appears to be random in the natural world is governed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, you know, when Allah bestows this rain upon people, they rejoice. You know, people, well, you know, in the springtime when the, the flowers bloom, I mean, especially if you've gone to, you know, the community gardens or farmer's markets, everybody's happy and they're enjoying the flowers and the greenery, they're rejoicing. They're enjoying the, the blessings of Allah. And subhanAllah, even the people who reject the existence of God, Allah doesn't deprive them of these blessings. Allah still allows them to, uh, to enjoy. Now in uh, verse number 49, again, I'll just go through these uh, pretty quickly. وَإِن كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلِ أَيُّ نَزَّلَ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ لَمُبْلِسِينَ so they, they rejoice when the blessing of rain is bestowed upon them. Though previously, before it was sent down upon them, they had been in despair. You know, and this shows you how fickle, how conditional, how opportunistic our relationship with Allah is. We rejoice when He gives us, and we become hopeless when we are deprived. When we're deprived of some of His blessings, you know, we're never... We're never totally deprived of Allah's rahmah. That's, that would be impossible. We celebrate and we're jubilant when He bestows a ni'mah upon us. And when we rejoice, we rarely even express gratitude to Him. And when one ni'mah is removed from our lives, we become, we become hopeless. We fall into despair. You know, this is why Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam, uh, he says, you know, that, that blessings are ignored. They are unknown as long as they remain. But when the ni'mah, when the blessings depart, this is when they are recognized. So, you know, this, this speaks to this kind of transactional attitude that we have with Allah. And we shouldn't have this transactional attitude. We shouldn't rejoice and become too excited when we're when we're given things, and then we, you know, we celebrate when a ni'mah comes, and then when it departs, we become we become very bitter and we fall into despair. We have to have the attitude of that the Ahlul Bayt taught us. Alhamdulillah ala kulli hal. We thank Allah when He gives, and we thank Allah when He takes, and even when He takes, it's a rahmah. Because there is some, there is something that Allah wants to teach us. There is a lesson, and believe me, what we learn in times of loss is often greater than what we learn when we receive. So we have to think of the deprivation of certain blessings as a blessing in disguise, in and of itself. And then ayah number fifty. فَانْظُرْ إِلَىٰ آثَارِ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ كَيْفَ يُحْيِي الْأَرْضَ بَعْدَ مَوْتِهَا إِنَّ ذَلِكَ لَمُحْيِي الْمَوْتَىٰ وَهُوَ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٍ So observe the vestiges or the effects of God's mercy. You know, brothers and sisters, before I complete the, the ayah, you know, this is really an invitation to explore the natural world. You know, this ayah can be understood in the context of, oh, Muslims, study the natural world. Appreciate the beauty of God's creation. Reflect on the effects of His mercy throughout creation. You know, this is why the Islamic world produced some of the most brilliant scientists. It's because of this, this invitation to scientific inquiry, to look and to explore the creation of God. And this even gives a very beautiful lens to a Muslim scientist that we're studying everything through the lens of divine grace. That everything is a rahmah, everything has a benefit, everything has a purpose. Explore, observe the vestiges of God's mercy. And specifically, what does Allah want us to think about? How He revives the earth. 
after its death. Truly, that is the reviver of the dead. And he is powerful over all things. One of the, the greatest manifestations of Allah's udra, of Allah's power, is his ability to revive the dead. And Allah does this every day, every moment, every instant. That you see the earth is devoid of life. Allah sends down rain and it is revived. Even the most barren land, even the most barren land can be brought to life. And this is, you know, and this is also, a, a, it's important for us to reflect on this. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of his names is what? Al-Muhi, the one who gives life. The one who gives life. It's important for us to reflect on this name of Allah. He is the one who gives life to things after they die. But oftentimes we only think about this in the literal sense. Meaning we, we think, oh, al-muhi means that when the flowers wither away or when the plants die or when the trees die, when the vegetation you know, becomes dry, Allah sends down rain and it comes back to life. We think of al-muhi al as, as we visualize it as springtime. But how about al-muhi in the spiritual sense? You know, sometimes, you know, we feel dead inside. We feel spiritually dead and we become hopeless. We think to ourselves that, you know, I'm, I'm so far away from God. I'm so far away from religion. I know I just, I've drifted too far away from the path. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here. It's important for us to think about this. That the same Lord who can give life to that dead plant, you think he cannot give life to a heart that has died? When Allah wants to revive the plants, he sends the rain, he sends the rain of his mercy, he sends, mer he sends this, this rain to bring it back to life. If we want our hearts to come back to life, we have to expose it to a spiritual rain. And that is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the spiritual rain. Expose our hearts to the word of Allah. So in the same way that the earth can be restored, it can come back to life. When, when it's exposed to rain, our hearts can also be brought back to life. You know, and this reminds me of the story of, the story of, uh, one of the uh, one of the contemporaries of Imam al Sadiq, you know, Fulayl ibn Iyad, and this man, his story is very famous. He was, you know, living during the time of Imam al Sadiq, and he was a wicked person. He was a a robber. He was a bandit. He was, you know, whatever you want to call him, a, a gang leader, a thug, a, a highway robber. He was known for pillaging entire villages. A person who, by any measure, you would assume that this person is heartless. He has a dead heart. But what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does he do? You know, there's, his story is very beautiful. On one occasion, he was climbing the fence to break into a house. As he was climbing... He heard the neighbor reciting one verse of the Quran, a verse of the Quran, and he heard it from Surah Al Hadid. Alam yani lil ladina, lil ladina amanu an taqsha an taqsha qulubuhum li dhikrillah. Is it not time for the believers to humble their hearts before God, to humble their hearts before Allah? When he heard this. It struck his heart. He had a dead heart. But this ayah was like water that was sprinkled on his heart. He had a moment of clarity, a moment of deep introspection. And he said to himself, it is the time. Yes, 
now is the time for me to humble my heart before my Lord. And he repented. And not only does Fulayl ibn Iyad repent, it would have been a very beautiful story of redemption if he just repented. But not only does he repent, he joins the classes of Imam al-Sadiq in Medina. He sits and he learns under that blessed pulpit for years. Until he becomes one of the greatest urafa of his time. He becomes a mystic. He becomes one of the greatest transmitters of the traditions of Imam al-Sadiq. Fulayl ibn Iyad. This is what it means when we say Allah is Al-Muhi, that He is the, the reviver. Because Allah revived His heart. He brought it back to life. So we have to expose our hearts to this, to the reign of the Quran, the Word of God. See how, you know, if, if, if you're in the right place at the right time and you're in the right mindset, all it takes is one ayah. You know, some of us, we can read the Quran from cover to cover and it doesn't have the effect that it has that it had on Fulayl ibn Iyad. So we have, to, we have to reflect, we have to ponder, we have to want guidance, we have to want nearness to Allah in the same way that a thirsty person wants water. There has to be this thirst. فَانْظُرْ إِلَىٰ آثَارِ رَحْمَةِ so observe the vestiges of God's mercy. Here it's speaking about the context of water, specifically. I mean, if you look at the siyaq, the, the context, I mean, just think about just the benefit, the effects of one of Allah's blessings, which is rain. Some of the blessings of rain include what? When it rains, the, the air that we breathe is cleaned. The pollutants are removed. You know, the, the aquifers are replenished, the streams are replenished, the vegetation grows, humidity is added to the, to the air, and, the, and so on and so forth. These are the effects of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. And this is what is known and what is beyond our knowledge is even, even more than that. Verse number... 51 And were we to send a wind and they were to see it turn yellow, after that they would surely disbelieve. Now, what does it mean when Allah says, and were we to send a wind? Now, again, here. Wind is, this wind is a destructive force. So here you notice that it's used in the singular. And were we to send a wind and they were to see it turn yellow. So what turns yellow? So there's a discussion among the scholars about what, what turns yellow. Is it the clouds? Is it uh, the wind? It seems that the most plausible interpretation is that the vegetation, you know, a destructive wind comes, plants are uprooted, you know, they, uh, they're, because of the lack of, because of a lack of water, for example, they dry out and they become yellow. After that, after the, the destruction of the vegetation, for example, they would surely disbelieve. So here, you know, in contrast, so, you, so look at the contrast of this verse to the previous verse, verses 46 to 50. So in contrast to the the positive reaction to the winds of mercy. So when the winds of mercy come, we said that people rejoice and they, they, they jubilantly partake in the ni'mah of Allah, as mentioned in verses 46 to 50. So but look at the contrast. But when people are confronted with a wind that removes these blessings, people think poorly of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They, they develop a, a negative opinion of God. They fail to, to trust Him. So again, it, it goes back to that idea that, that our conception of God depends on how, how good our lives are. If life is good, I'm happy with Allah. If life is not going according to plan, either I reject Him 
or I think poorly of him, or I don't trust him, or I start to complain to him. So we have, we, the problem with many of us is that we, we have this kind of, you scratch my back, I scratch your back type of relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, so this again speaks to the, the, you know, how, how human beings, they vacillate between rejoicing and despairing, that there's no stability. You know, most people don't have that firm iman where no matter what's happening, they're, 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 they express gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that their faith is firm. Many people, if things are don't going good, Alhamdulillah. If things are going bad, that's when they are they are shaken up. Verse number fifty-two. لا تسمع الموتى ولا تسمع Surely you cannot make the dead hear, nor can you make the deaf hear the call when they turn their backs. And I'll also read ayah number 53 because it's connected and then I'll share a quick reflection. Ayah number 53. Nor can you guide the blind from their straying. You make none here except those who believe in our signs and our submitters. Verses 52 and 53 seem to place people into four categories. And you see that the ayah begins with the most, the most dangerous group. فَإِنَّكَ لَا تُسْمِعُ الْمَوْتَى So Allah is basically telling the Prophet that you cannot make the dead hear. You know, the Prophet used to, he, he had so much concern. He cared so much about people's well-being, their spiritual well-being, that he used to get frustrated that people were ignorant and they were lost. He desperately wanted to guide people. So much so that Allah says in Surah Al-Kahf, for example, you know, just kind of highlighting how, how much pain the Prophet felt when he saw people living these lives of, of uh, these, these lives that were far from the path of Allah. Rasulullah, it seems that you are going to die of grief because they, because they don't, they, they will not believe in the, the message. So Allah says, Number one, you cannot make the dead hear, nor can you make the deaf hear the call. If they are, if they, if they're turning their backs. So this shows us, brothers and sisters, that even the Prophet with his wisdom, with his knowledge, with his mercy, with his effective communicating skills. He cannot guide someone who refuses to be guided. You know, it's it's like the example of, you know, a physician. I can bring the best physician in the world. I can send you to the best physician in the world if you're ill. But if you refuse to take the medicine, if you refuse to follow the doctor's prescription, nothing's going to happen. And that's and, and you being sick is not a reflection of the doctor's incompetence. You know, so, so, you know, perhaps the prophet felt that, you know, is the problem with me? Why are they not coming to, towards God? Why are they not coming towards faith? Why are they so rebellious? So it seems that maybe on some level, the prophet was wondering that, what's the problem here? Allah says, فَإِنَّكَ لَا تُسْمِعُ الْمَوْتَى Ya Rasulullah, don't worry. Your job is to deliver the message, is to convey revelation, is to teach. The problem is not in you, Ya Rasulullah. The problem is with your audience. The first, so there are three types of people, right? 
that are mentioned. The fourth are the, the believers who are receptive. There are those who are dead. They're spiritually dead. They have dead hearts. They have dead hearts. Can't do anything about them. Unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intervenes and there is some, you know, special divine grace, they're dead. So imagine, imagine you're talking to a corpse. Allah gives the Prophet a visual that it's not, it's not the fault of the person who's speaking. You're, this is a dead body. It's a corpse that you're talking to. Spiritually dead. And then, so this is the worst group. al mota Surely you cannot make the dead here. The second group. وَلَا تُسْمِعُ الصُّمَّ الدُّعَاءِ You cannot make the death here. Now, those who are dead... That's almost impossible. There has to be like a mu'jiza for them to uh, to hear your words, to, to perceive your words. But how about someone who's deaf? Someone who's deaf, this is still an impediment to guidance. But it's not as bad as someone who's dead. Because someone who is deaf can still understand sign language. So yes, they have lost some of their spiritual faculties but even if a, if a if a deaf person you know even deafness has degrees if you maybe if you're if you're very close to them it might have an effect if they're look if they're giving you their undivided attention you know maybe through some other means you can guide them as opposed to the first group who is dead so the second group the second group is what those who are dead they're, they're, it's difficult to guide them But it's easier to guide them Than those who are dead But it's very difficult To, to guide a deaf person Who's retreating They're not even facing you If they weren't running away From truth If they turn towards you Maybe through you know, sign language You could bring them And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Mentions what in ayah number 53 وَمَا أَنْتَ بِهَادِ الْعُمْيَ عَنْ ضَلَالَتِهِمْ The blind. The blind. You know, and because the Qur'an is a, is a miracle of the ear, the least severe spiritual disease is the, is the blindness, because at least you could still hear the message. And then the fourth group, are, this is the group that is the most receptive. إِن تُسْمِعُ إِلَّا مَا يُؤْمِنُ بِآيَاتِنَا فَهُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ you can, you can make none here except those who believe in our signs and our submitters. Those who have an appreciation for a higher power. They may have not submitted in the formal sense, but they are ones who concede to truth. They understand. They concede to the metaphysical. They concede to a higher power. There is a, there is a primordial goodness that is within them. They have, they have some noble traits in them. Those are the people that will hear you, Ya Rasulullah. And this is why, you know, this is, you know, if you think about it, Abu Lahab heard the Prophet. Abu Dhar heard the Prophet. Why did Abu Dhar accept? And why did Abu Lahab reject? It's not random. It's because there was something, because Abu Dhar had certain noble qualities. That distinguished him from others. That's why he came. He's part of, he's that fourth group. He was inclined. He had a love of the truth. And because of this love that he had for the truth, Allah gave them the tawfiq uh, for hidayah. With that, inshallah, we'll conclude uh, our discussion and uh, we'll uh, pick up uh, our conversation uh, next week. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Any questions or comments? Awesome, Sheikh. Uh, could you just uh, explain the difference between the blind and the deaf and how we could apply this information to our lives? Now, <clears throat> it's it's difficult for us to to really know what causes spiritual blindness and what causes uh, spiritual deafness. Now, 
I, I brought a, a collection of a hadith that I'll, uh, I'll share where Imam al-Baqir when he was asked about spiritual blindness. Now, when we speak about blindness and deafness, obviously we're not speaking about those who have these uh, these physical disabilities, you know, because blindness and deafness, these are disabilities. So, but, so obviously we're not talking about that. We're talking about this, the, the loss of these spiritual faculties. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, he, when he speaks about spiritual blindness, he cites an ayah of the Quran where Allah says, وَمَنْ كَانَ فِي هَذِهِ أَعْمَى Whoever is blind in, in this life, in the earth, this earthly life, فَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ أَعْمَى They will be resurrected blind. Now what does this mean? Imam al-Baqir, he says, blindness means مَنْ لَمْ يَدُلَّهُ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافِ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ وَدَوَرَانُ الْفُلْكِ بِالشَّمْسِ وَالْقَمَرِ وَالْآيَاتُ الْعَجِيبَاتِ عَلَىٰ أَنَّ وَرَاءَ ذَلِكَ أَمْرًا هُوَ أَعْظَمُ مِنْهَا Imam al-Baqir says, the one who is blind is the one who looks at, who observes the heavens and the earth and the alternation of day and night and the movement of the celestial bodies and the, the movement of the sun and the moon and all of these incredible signs and that does not lead them to recognize that there is a higher power governing all of this imam al Bafa says such a such a person is blind so on a practical level if we are not people of reflection if we're not observing the world and using our observations of the natural world to connect us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we're not using <clears throat> that faculty of insight. Because really, what we're talking about is insight. And when, and just like any muscle, when you don't exercise tafakkur, when you don't exercise that, uh, that muscle, you lose it. So just in, in the same way, you know, if I'm laying in bed all day, and I don't walk, and I don't use the muscles in my quads, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose that function. So this is why it's important to engage in tafakkur on a daily basis. You know, that's why sometimes, you know, at home, I like to watch, you know, some of these, uh, you know, these Netflix documentaries about nature. You know, you learn something new about, you know, the creatures that inhabit the seas. You learn something about the universe and that, that deepens your, your, your awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and, and reflecting on these things when you recite dua. So this is really a way to kind of ensure that we're sharpening the eye of our heart, our spiritual vision, and we don't become those who, who become blind. And, you know, when it comes to, you know, spiritual uh, uh, deafness, I mean, you could only imagine that, you know, an ear that listens to haram is probably not going to be an ear that is going to be receptive when it hears the Quran. Now, even though the, the ear that listens to music or backbiting or gossip can still physically hear the Quran, but the impact of the Quran is going to be compromised because you've used the ear in a way that it wasn't created to be used. You are using it in a way that is that, uh, that is defying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we speak about sight and hearing, we have to use these faculties in ways that are going to make us better human beings, that are, gonna be, that are bringing us closer to Allah. If we don't use them in that way, those faculties will lose their, their function, and ultimately uh, we will uh, we'll become spiritually a handicap and just one final comment about uh, uh you know having dead hearts because i think i think when you come across verses like that you know it should it should definitely give us pause because we don't want our hearts to die you know we we don't want to reach a level where 
a calamity has to happen for us to be resuscitated, to be spiritually resuscitated. Just one hadith from Imam al-Baqir where uh, Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam actually quotes the Prophet who mentions four things that cause the heart to die. And now, and this doesn't mean that these are the only four, but these are four things that many people have a tendency to commit. And it, it has a detrimental effect on the, the heart. So the Prophet says, There are four things that cause the heart to die, that kill the heart, the spiritual heart. Number one is, Sinning, persistent sinning. You know, sometimes we sin and we make toba. But sometimes we sin, we don't make toba, and we sin again and again and again. If you're committing a sin persistently and you're not making toba, you are you're doing something that is causing the heart to die. You know, this is presumably why you don't feel anything when you pray, you don't feel anything when you listen to dua. It's because your heart is is dying. Number of, the second thing is nisa, speaking excessively with with women. Now here, of course, the prophet is addressing a male audience, but what this means is that we have to be careful when we interact with non mahram. You don't need to engage in unnecessary talk with the opposite gender, because what happens when when males and females are, are too laid back when it comes to their interactions. They start to flirt. They start to say inappropriate things. You know, I, f- families have fallen apart because of people who are, they don't have discipline when they speak to the opposite gender. And this, you know, and this type of behavior causes the heart to die because these are things that pull you towards the muharramat. That we have to be very formal when we interact with the opposite gender. You have to respect, you know, if, if you're married, you have to respect the sanctity of your marriage. You have to expect, you have to respect, you know, the sanctity of, of uh, the family. You know, this is someone's daughter in the same way you don't want someone, you know, just chatting and flirting with your sister or your daughter or your mother. You have to, you have to show, you have to reciprocate that same level of ihtaram. So you have to be cautious when you interact with the opposite gender. And this is where a lot of people fail, especially with the advent of social media. People, they don't behave uh, appropriately with the opposite gender. Being very loose when it comes to uh, gender relations. Arguing with a fool. You know, people like to debate. SubhanAllah. You go on YouTube, people debate about everything. And the worst of them is are the religious debates. Why is why does this cause the heart to die? You know, when you debate with someone who's a fool, who's ignorant, chances are it's not going to be a productive conversation. Chances are you're going to lose your patience. They're going to lose your patience. It's going to become a shouting match. And what have you done for your spirituality? You're going to start using your tongue in a way that is inappropriate for a believer. You might use harsh language, which will, you know, completely nullify many of your good deeds. You may say something rude. So do not debate with people who are not people of knowledge. Don't debate with people who are who are ignorant and they don't have uh, any background knowledge. And then the prophet says. The fourth thing that causes people to, that causes the heart to die is to sit with dead people. Now, when the Prophet said this, the companions, the Sahaba, they said, Ya Rasulullah, who are, who are dead people? And we've never seen someone who sits with a bunch of corpses. The Prophet says, no, I'm not talking about the, those who are literally dead. I'm talking about kullu ghaniyan mutra. I'm speaking about sitting with rich people who love to indulge in dunya. You don't want to be around people who are obsessed with dunya because it will diminish your spirituality. Because when you hang around people who 
all they talk about is my Gucci belt and my Rolex and my, you know, you know, Tom Ford sunglasses and, you know, and they want to drive, go in their Ferrari. And that's all they talk about because they have nothing else to talk about. If you associate with these types of people, what do you think is going to happen? Is your heart going to be filled with nur and ma'rifa? It's going to die because you're slowly, you're going to start obsessing over the material world. And Imam al-Sadiq, what does he say? The love of dunya is the root of all sin. So you have to be, be, uh, be careful about associating with people who have who are very materialistically inclined. Now, we're not saying be rude, but pay attention to whose company you keep. And uh, hopefully that wasn't too long, uh, too long and drawn out uh, answer to your question. Hopefully you found that useful. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, it was interesting how some of the verses, uh, in some verses of the Quran, it refers to people who are in hardship and say that the hardship causes them to enter disbelief, as in verse 51. And other yeah. verses mention that the hardship is what causes people to remember Allah, and they're only in remembering Allah during the hardship times. And when ease comes, they forget. Now, now, now if, if, if you recall, I, I think I mentioned this, where the hardships where people generally turn to Allah are... Those those moments of extreme fear, you know, like for example, if there if a natural disaster hits, not just you know, for example, if you know if if something, you know, the, the normal things happen in life where you know you might have gotten a flat tire or you know you didn't get that promotion or you you know you didn't qualify for uh, you know that uh, that job, we're talking about those instances where you feel like your life is in danger and it's an extreme calamity. That's when you're when you go through that those moments of intense grief. That's when hearts, because of the fitrah, they they're reoriented towards God. But when it comes to those, you know, this the the ups and downs of life, those normal downs, people just kind of they just despair and they complain, and uh, so it's really those. You know, that that's why if you look at some of the verses, Allah speaks about people who are on boats and. You know, this horrible storm comes and they feel that they're not going to make it. And then they call upon Allah sincerely. And then when Allah rescues them, they forget. So in that moment of intense fear, that's when the heart clings to Allah. You know, for, so if the airplane is, you know, if, if the captain is like, you know, we, we're mayday, mayday, you know, we're, we're going to we're gonna crash. And people, they see the, you know, the, uh, the masks are deployed and they feel that their lives are going to come, come coming to an end. Everyone on that plane is praying. Even the agnostic is probably praying. Why? Fitra. Because at that moment, you are fully aware of how you're fully aware of your vulnerability, your limitation, your powerlessness, and you naturally recognize that there is a higher power. But most of the time, we're oblivious. We're deluded into thinking that we are, we're powerful, we're strong, we're capable, we have resources. And we think we're independent of Allah. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, thank you. Yeah. And um, is a, are prophets and messengers the same thing? And perhaps you could talk about Nabi and Rasul as well. Yeah, so so every every messenger, every Rasul is a prophet, but not every prophet is a messenger. Allah has sent, according to some traditions, 124,000 prophets. Among them, 313 are messengers. And, you know, messengers are individuals who, who are given a specific message. They might be given a book, a specific message for a community. And those who are not messengers, they typically invite their communities to follow the path of, uh, of that messenger. So, for example, Musa is a messenger. And you have, for example... You know, Allah sent Dawood, Dawood, for example, a prophet. Now, Dawood, no, Dawood might not be a good example because he was given the Zabur. But Allah, imagine another prophet from Bani Israel. Another prophet from Bani Israel would be calling people to the Sharia of Musa. So, 
sometimes so prophets typically uh, messengers typically have a certain responsibility a certain message to deliver to the community whereas prophets you know a prophet might but ju might just be a prophet for themselves They're, they weren't given any specific message to deliver whereas messengers uh, have uh, have a message to deliver and they constitute 313 of the 20 of the 124,000 And was Prophet Yaqub a messenger? And if so, was he sent to an epicenter of some city? So Yaqub, Yaqub, it seems that uh, he was uh, he was a messenger, and not only a messenger, but he was uh, he was an imam. Because if you look at the Quran, I think I think we discussed this in Surah Al Anbiya, after mentioning Yaqub and. And, uh, and some of the other prophets of Bani Israel, Allah says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا So they, some of them have reached the maqam of, uh, of imam. So they are not only uh, messengers, but they're also uh, uh, imams. Uh, so I mean, this was in the context of, uh, I believe, Yaqub and some of the other uh, uh, messengers. And one thing that's interesting in, in verse 50 is that Allah mentioned that he brings the land back to life. And the land is not generally something that we think of as living. It's kind of the plants that are on the land that we consider it as like kind of having the land come back to life when there's plants starting to grow again. And might there be some parallel to the, the cells that make up our body when the individual cells are alive? I, I don't think so. I mean, it, that's that would have to be proven. I mean, that, that's, you know, that's, this is kind of a rhetorical device that's used in the Quran where, you know, for example, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, fas'al al-qarya, ask the, the village. Now, of course, Allah is not talking, Allah doesn't mean literally ask the village, ask the people of the village. So it's not, you know, sometimes what is meant is, is, is omitted. So when Allah says he revives the, the earth, meaning the plants that grow from uh, the earth, that's, uh, so even though it's not explicitly mentioned, it's, uh, it's implied just by the, uh, the context. So when Allah says, you know, you know فَسْأَلِ الْقَرْيَةِ Ask the town, well, you're going you're to ask the, the buildings? No, you ask the people of the town. So, so sometimes what is uh, just because something's not explicitly mentioned, it's implied uh, from the context. Thank you so much, Sheikh. Jazakumullah. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share some brief uh, reflections. And if Allah continues to give us life and tawfiq we will continue this discussion next week inshallah looking forward to it thank you so much